Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation webinar um, by the wonderful Simon Clayton. Um, just want to check that the people that have joined, the attendees, can hear my mic and can hear and see all of the stuff. So if you've got um, if you if you've got the chat window open can you just message and say whether or not you can hear my mic and see the screen so that we're starting off on the on the right settings i can hear you <laughs> that's useful simon <laughs> Uh, but only text on the screen. Yes, at the moment, there'll be text on the screen. I think that's the first slide by Simon. It is, yep. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so today we're going to be running through um, how GDPR affects small businesses and what PCR is and how they intersect, because it's important that we understand both of those particular sets of laws and how they are going to affect us going forward. So I'm not going to have a long-winded introduction, some might say too late, but I'm just going to hand over without any fanfare or folder roll to the wonderful, lovely Simon Clayton. Uh, thank you, Stu. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we are recording this as well, so we'll put a, a video up um, after this for people that aren't able to attend. So as Stu said, um, well, first of all, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, we are doing an introduction to GDPR and PCR. PCR is not new, but how they interact, uh, how it interacts with GDPR is really important, and it will cl help clear up a lot of misconceptions around GDPR at the moment. Um, this is my first ever webinar as well, which is uh, interesting. I'm used to talking to an audience, uh, which makes this a little more odd, but uh, uh, so hopefully the technology will hold up. One thing I've already mentioned to Stu is that feel free to type questions as we go through, but um, there's a lot to crack through and I'm going to definitely keep this to two hours, which I know is a long time for a webinar, but uh, we may well take those questions onto the Facebook group later and deal with them then. So, uh, without further ado, so very brief introductions. Who are we? This is a slide that you'll see at the bottom. It says event master, uh, GDPR masterclass and event reference.com. These are slides that I've done for the events industry at several live seminars. Um, so I just hadn't got around to taking the branding off the bottom there, but it doesn't really matter. So my, uh, my company is RevTech. Um, we have a core product called eventreference.com and we work in the events industry. So we do registration systems for the events industry. So we deal with lots and lots of data, uh, millions of records. Uh, we're also ISO 27001 certified, uh, which is a really good thing. It's, it's not that difficult to do, um, depending on how much spare resource you've got. There's lots of uh, procedures that you've got to write out and stuff but it, it does help with things like GDPR because it proves that you've got a level of protection in place it's the, the standard British the British standard for well the international standard for data safety so who am I I'm Simon Clayton um, I am a programmer techie and geek um, I've always been a geek I'm massively obsessed with gadgets and stuff but I'm also a business person and I'm very pragmatic when it comes to technology, um, except in my personal life. I love, love gadgets, but they've got to have a real reason in business. Um, I'm also a GDPR certified practitioner, although I'll caveat that by saying it's meaningless. Um, I've been on a, a four day training course, I've passed two exams, but there are no bodies in the UK currently certified to provide certified training. The ICO will have to certify these bodies and nobody's been given that certification yet. So uh, uh, I've also done the IDM uh, course on GDPR and I've been helping them correct it. Um, okay, so an important disclaimer, um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I've studied GDPR extensively. I've read the entire law. I've read PECA, um, but uh, I'm not legally qualified, so none of this constitutes legal advice. 
So that's the introductions and stuff out of the way. So diving straight in, what is GDPR? Well, as Stu mentioned earlier, it stands for General Data Protection Regulation. Technically, it's this regulation number. And it's defined in a document that contains 99 articles and 173 recitals. The recitals are the explanations of the law, the interpretations of the law. The articles are the actual law. Uh, it's not actually a bad read, and there are quite a few articles that we'll refer to in this stuff that actually are worth reading. You can download the GDPR. Um, that's all right, I'm just looking at comments here. Uh, Sean says, still seeing original gray screen with no text white, uh, with white text, no branding. Oh, I'm not sure what you're seeing there. Can you see the, the slides that we're doing now? I hope everybody else can. Stu, can you see the slides? Yeah, I, I can see the slides. Yeah, not a problem. Hmm. Um, uh, okay. Um, I'm not Sean, sure. Sean, you know. try logging out and logging back in again. So close it down and come back in. It may be that you just came in and it glitched. I don't know. Strange. Um, anyway, I have to carry on. A uh, lot to crack through. So um, it will be law across all EU member states, and that includes the UK. Um, one of the misconceptions I've heard uh, in recent months is that Brexit will make any difference to this at all. Brexit won't make any difference purely because, um, A, Brexit won't happen before May the 25th, and B, the UK has already got a draft law going through Parliament for uh, our own data protection law that will replace GDPR, which is pretty much in line with GDPR anyway. It adds a lot of extra stuff as well for uh, legal entities and uh, uh, for law enforcement, but it, it will cover the same stuff. Crucially, GDPR covers any personally identifiable information stored in any form whatsoever. So we'll come on to that in a, a few minutes in more detail. Um, the aim of GDPR is to prevent security breaches by organizations that hold personally identifiable information. And I have to say, I think GDPR is a good thing generally. Um, I think it's time that data protection was strengthened across Europe. Um, and one of the key goals of GDPR was to replace the data protection directive, which came from the EU in uh, 92, I think, 92, 93. The data protection directive, the difference between a directive and a regulation is that a directive is basically what the EU would like member states to do. And the UK government then created the Data Protection Act, but it has to be put into local laws. A regulation is law across all EU member states. So that's the difference there. So more about what GDPR is. Um, I'm sure everybody's seen the headlines, potentially huge financial penalties for breaking the regulations. We will talk about that in a minute. I don't really think there's anything particularly serious to worry about with that for most businesses, but we'll explain why shortly. It does apply to all businesses in the EU that hold personally identifiable information about anybody. So if your business is based in the EU and you hold PII about people in Australia, GDPR still applies. Um, and it doesn't matter where you store that data. You can't get around this by storing the data in the US, for example. It also applies to any business worldwide that holds PII about people in the EU. Now, notice I'm saying people in the EU there. This is specifically not citizens. It's anybody in the EU. So that would apply to illegal immigrants, tourists, anything else. If they're in the EU at the time the data was collected, they're technically covered by GDPR. Oh, look, I've got a bullet point for that. Um, so the, the regulation says data subjects who are in the union. Um, so... Let's look at what that really means. It's about data controllers being accountable, transparent, and fair. That's the stated aims of GDPR. And I believe that's a really, really good thing. 
Uh, too many data controllers, and we'll define exactly what a data controller is in a second, but too many data controllers are just riding roughshod over people's data and treating it unfairly. And so it's important that there's a shift for that. Also, it introduces the concept that organizations do not own personal data. They're borrowing it from the data subjects, that's all. Um, and they are permitted to use that personal data if the data subject wants them to. So that's quite a big shift from DPA. But actually, in reality, a lot of the difference between DPA and GDPR is quite minor. There are some key differences, but they're quite minor. The real shakeup, from my point of view, is the transparency. Because with GDPR, nobody can tell if, sorry, with DPA, nobody can tell if you're actually following the rules or not, unless you get investigated. With GDPR, you have to be transparent about what you're doing with people's data and why. And if you're not being transparent, then it's clearly evident that you're not adhering to GDPR. So then you're much more likely to get reported to the ICO and much more likely to get investigated. The ICO have been recruiting 200 new caseworkers. Uh, I think the ICO had around 500 staff and they're recruiting another 200 purely for GDPR. Um, so, what isn't GDPR? Right, well this is really, really important. GDPR does not control communications to individuals at all. GDPR has some stipulations that there are some things you have to tell people, but it doesn't have any bearing on marketing. There is a thing called Recital 47. Recital 47 has been quoted all over the place, and it says that you may be able to use direct marketing as a legitimate interest. We'll come on to that in a little bit. But crucially, in the UK at least, electronic communications are covered by PECA. Pe uh, PECA is the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. I've got some slides on that later. Postal communications, interestingly, are not regulated. So that's why I, I saw a mailing from the Royal Mail recently um, trying to promote uh, postal as a way to get around GDPR, um, which is weird because you're getting around PECA, not GDPR, but uh, you can post out all you want, that's fine, um, but you can't, it, there's no regulations covering that. Also, PECA will be replaced by e-privacy. Again, this is another, um, EU directive uh, regulation in fact the e-privacy directive as it currently is was turned into PECA and the e-privacy regulation is going through the final stages of negotiations between various bodies involved and we don't know exactly when the e-privacy regulation will come along but that will replace PECA entirely and could introduce some significant changes. Uh, we'll keep the group updated on that as we know more. So GDPR timeline. It started on April 27th, 2016 when it was signed off by the European Parliament. On May the 24th, it was adopted in all EU member states. Oops. Adopted in all EU member states. And on the 25th of May 2018, it's enforceable. That's really important. That's when the ICO start taking action against this stuff. The difficulty for us is that there's fuzziness. There's still things in GDPR that we don't know. Um, I'll talk about a very specific instance shortly where I've had in, uh, a written communication from the ICO which surprised me. Um, the ICO say some of the guidance would be published early 2018. We're still waiting, unfortunately. Um, we don't know when the guidance will be coming out. I was at um, a data protection conference a couple of weeks ago, and they had no idea when that, the rest of the guidance would be available. We do have some guidance. We've got draft guidance on consent, which we'll talk about as a separate subject shortly. Um, but there are areas that we've got problems with. The good news is for most small businesses and business owners, it probably not critical stuff. So clear up some definitions. What is personally, personally identifiable information? Well, 
If a living individual can be identified from the data, then it's PII in simple terms. GDPR Article 4.1 says inf information relating to an identifiable natural person. That's really crucial. It has to be a person who can be identified directly or indirectly. So even if you don't have all of the information in your database that could identify that individual, if it could be combined with other information, then it would still be uh, classed as personally identifiable information. However, there are uh, recitals that cover this and they take into account the level of difficulty and practicality of doing that. So whereas in an IP address is classified as personally identifiable information by the EU government. But in reality, most web servers store IP addresses in the log files. The reality of combining that with other information to get back to an individual is really, really slim. So it, it's, it would be very difficult to do. It, it's probably not anything that you need to worry about. But if you've got data that could lead to a person, that's PII. In addition to PII, we have sensitive data, which is another level of uh, severity. You have to be much more careful with sensitive data. Uh, special categories of personal data are things like racial or ethnic origin, political opinion or affiliation, religious or, politi religious or political beliefs, trade union memberships, genetic or biometric data. That's really important. So anything that's storing you know, facial recognition, fingerprints, all of that kind of stuff, suddenly counts as special category data and needs a, a higher standard of uh, permission to use it. Anything health related, anything sex life or sexual orientation. Uh, those are the special category data, the sensitive data that you need to be more careful with. If you're holding any of that, you need to uh, get some proper advice. So who does it protect? Living people, crucially. Uh, it doesn't cover dead people. Um, it specifically says in GDPR that dead people may be covered by other <coughs> local laws. Um, whatever their nationality or place of resident, doesn't apply to deceased, and also doesn't apply to a legal person. So a legal person might be a company, uh, a legal entity that it is classed as a person for terms of some legal processes, but it doesn't in terms of GDPR. So is anybody exempt from GDPR? Who doesn't have to obey it? There are some exemptions, but they're very, very limited. A natural person in the course of a purely personal or household activity, that is one exemption. So your Christmas card lists are all fine. Um, and public authorities for criminal offences, investigation, detection, prosecution. Um, and there are some small limitations on, for small companies. They are quite small limitations. You have to have under 250 employees, and the processing is not occasional. Now... That's the bit of advice I had from the ICO. I, I emailed them back in November and said, can you tell me how do you define occasional? If I've got a CRM system with a thousand records and I look at five different records every day, I'm looking at an individual record maybe every couple of months, but I'm looking at the whole data set every day. Is that occasional or not? And the official answer in writing I got said, we don't know. Well, okay, that's interesting. So this is back to the fuzziness. Um, the limitations, though, are under Article 30 rules, there are limits on the record keeping that small companies have to do. And actually, those record keeping, that, that record keeping isn't a bad thing, and it's not particularly onerous. So it, it's probably worth doing anyway. We'll come on to that. So what is processing of data? Basically, any operation performed on personal data, collecting it, organizing, structuring, storage, anything that you're going to do with personal data, even viewing technically. I mean, if you're viewing data in a web browser and you're on holiday in South America, you've technically transferred that data outside of the EU, which could be a violation of GDPR. It also covers all data storage in any form. Um, so it doesn't matter if you chisel it into stone tablets. If it's PII, it's still covered by GDPR. Um, and that's really critical. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was sitting in my dentist's waiting room this week, um, reading their privacy policy, as you do. And um, one of the things that they said was that 
the subject access request was £10 for electronic information or £40 for information on paper. Um, all of that changes under GDPR and we'll come to that shortly. So, a data controller. What is a data controller? Well, this is one of the really important definitions. The data controller determines the purposes and manner in which personal data is processed. Basically, they control the why and the how of data processing. They, de they decide what data is going to be collected and why they're collecting it. That means they're responsible for the legal basis of collecting personal data. That's a really key part of GDPR. There are six legal bases for holding personal data, one of which is consent, which we'll come to shortly. Um, but you have to have a legal justification for holding somebody's personal data. We'll talk about that. They also choose what data to collect. Um, so the data controller will be the one that says, well, we need to know what your dog's name is and your inside leg measurement. We'll come on to that sort of stuff as well. Also, whether to allow subject access requests and other rights. There are instances where subject access requests can be denied, but the data controller is responsible for administering all of the rights of the data subjects. We're going to talk about those in detail. Crucially, also, the data retention period. This is a fairly serious part of GDPR, um, and it's known as storage limitation. We're going to talk about that as well. The data controller is normally an organization. It can be an individual if you're talking about a sole trader or a partnership. Um, but if there is a limited company or a PLC, you know, a legal entity for the company, then it would be that organization. So that's the data controller. There is a flip side to this, which is the data processor. The data processor is instructed by the controller what to do. So technically, um, my clients are the data controllers. They come to us and say, we want you to do registration for this event. We want to collect all of these bits of information and we're doing it for this legal purpose and so on and so on. They instruct us what to do and we do it. Um, the data processor can use their experience to decide technical stuff like how it's stored, methods of data transfer, what the backup plans are, the means of deleting data. Basically, the data controller doesn't have to be an expert in all aspects of you know, technical data storage, um, but the data controller must only act on the written instructions of the data controller. Data processor must only act on the written instructions of the data controller. That's crucial. And if you don't act on the written instructions of the controller, you could be opening yourself up to prosecution. You also must have a written data processing agreement, which covers the responsibilities of both parties. And finally, for a data processor, it's entirely probable that a data processor is also a data controller, but for other data. So every data processor will have other data sets, whether they're employment records or accounts or whatever else. They are a data controller for other data sets. If the data processor decides to do things on their own without written instructions, they then become a joint controller or could become a joint controller. They're either in breach of GDPR or could become a joint controller. And a joint controller is a different setup which adds complexity and we're not going to talk about it here. Um, if you're a data processor, stick to being a data processor and get a, an agreement and only act on the written instructions. It simplifies everything. It will also help to protect you in case of a breach. Um, which is next. So what is a data breach? So a personal data breach is a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful loss or deletion, alteration, unauthorized disclosure, or access to any personal data. Now, crucially, security here is um, not what most people think of. Most, If you think of data and security, you're going to think of IT security and firewalls and all that kind of stuff. But security, although it does cover that, it also covers organizational security. Um, and that's crucial. So if you have 100 people in your organization and you haven't got proper policies on who can access what data and what, that just, what their justification is for that data, then you can be 
in breach here because you have a lack of organizational security. In fact, Talk Talk were fined £100,000 for a lack of organizational security last year on top of all the other stuff they were fined for. So um, also loss or deletion. Again, remember that for small businesses, the loss of or accidental deletion of data that and you accidentally delete the data and you can't get it back, that's probably bad for you, but it probably doesn't impact your customers overly. It might. It, whether or not you'd be prosecuted is debatable. Probably not. But remember, GDPR covers any data storage for doctors, hospitals, where a loss of data could have really serious consequences. So it is very broad in that, that um, there are certain situations that would be viewed much, much more seriously by the regulators. It has to present a real chance of harm to the data subject if their data was lost, for example. Okay, ah, or otherwise processed. So personal data transmitted, stored, or processed. So the consequences, this is the interesting bit, I guess. Data controller for, and data processors have joint liability for breaches. This is new. This is not in DPA. This means that a data subject has the right to sue either the controller or the processor. This is why the processor must act on the written instructions of the controller and must have a data processing agreement because that's one way to protect yourself. You can be... Um, Protect yourself against being sued by demonstrating that you've got the that you've done nothing wrong, basically, that you've got all the right procedures and policies in place and the breach wasn't your fault. Data subjects can also sue for material and non-material damage. That's new. So we'll look at a specific example of that shortly. And also individually or jointly as a class action. That's new. That's potentially very big. It already happens lots and lots in the US. Um, the Equifax data breach. Um, Equifax are a credit checking company who had a massive data breach and handled it incredibly badly. Um, and they're currently facing what I've seen described as a very unusual 50 state class action. Um, it's not normal that all 50 states are in a class action, but the, the, this one is. They can also, as I mentioned, sue the data controller and or the data processor. And they can sue the supervisory authority if they don't take action when the complaint's raised. Um, the supervisory authority in the UK is obviously the ICO, um, who've been on the TV in very funky jackets recently. Um, and there are no upper limits on damages defined in these regulations. Again, potentially that's scary. So, supervisory authority fines. Let's look at that. Um, the supervisory authority, and it, it specifically talks about it this way because in every country there's a different supervisory authority, but you're governed by one supervisory authority no matter if you've got an office in France but your headquarters is in the UK, then you would be governed by the ICO. Um, and supervisory authorities uh, can communicate and collaborate on those kind of things. But they can impose administrative fines. They've been able to impose administrative fines under DPA, um, but they're powers are going up massively under GDPR. These fines are intended to be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. They're not intended to be punitive punishments. They are meant to be um, yeah, dissuasive to the organizations to encourage better behavior. The ICO can't levy a fine on a company that would put it out of business. That's part of the ICO's charter. Um, these fines can be mitigated that an effective framework is in place to protect the data. Again, that was sort of what we talked about. If you're a data processor acting on the instructions of the controller, if you're the controller making sure that the data processor only acts on your written instructions and that you're giving them good instructions, but also that you've done personal data audits and that you've got organizational control as well as technical uh, security. Um, and we'll cover those bits shortly. So, what are these fines? Well, the lower level of fine is up to 10 million euros or 2% of the previous year's global turnover, whichever is higher, for tier two breaches. And a tier two breach is things like child's consent, data protection by design and default, or the tasks of the data protection officer. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the exact details of that. We do talk about data protection by design and default in a little while. Um, the higher level, which is the one everybody's seen in the press, 
is up to 20 million euros or 4% of the previous year's turnover, whichever is higher. Um, and this is things like principles relating to the processing of personal data, lawfulness of processing, or conditions for consent, or special categories. So if you're not handling data correctly, or you haven't got a real legal reason for processing it, or your consent's not right, then you can be levied the, the higher fine. That said, I believe pretty much everything you've read about the, the fines is scaremongering. This is a headline I actually saw. Um, they, people are just saying, oh, no, no, it's, it's just going to be about fines. They, they need to get their money in. Um, in. In the year 2016, 2017, the ICO concluded 17,300 cases. That's a lot of cases. 16 of them resulted in fines. Okay, that puts it into perspective. Most of these cases, if they found any wrongdoing, then it was all about enforcement notices or trying to get those organizations to be better at looking after the personal data. Um, that comes from Elizabeth Denham's blog. So I've got the link there. We'll put these slides up as well. And uh, it's quite an interesting blog post, um, but it tries to put into perspective that they're not just about trying to hurt organizations with fines. I mean, interestingly, under DPA, they can find an organization up to half a million pounds and they never actually have. The closest they came was Talk Talk, who they find £400,000 for a, an inexcusable data breach, in my opinion, and they, I think they should have been fined the full half million. And then Talk Talk paid it early and got another £80,000 off. So, um, however, fines aren't the only punishment. Speaking of Talk Talk, they got fined four hundred grand in this one instance. They've been fined a number of other times too. But in 2016, they had 1.8 billion pounds of revenue, so a 4% fine would be 73.52 million. Well, okay, let's assume that the, the ICO didn't find them the full half million, they wouldn't find them 73 million either. So, I don't know, maybe they'll find them a million quid or something. It's, it's gonna sting, of course, but there are a lot of other consequences. They lost 101,000 customers because of reputational damage. The CEO resigned, and the reported cost of their business was 42 million pounds. So it stung a lot more than the 400,000 fine anyway, and that's important to remember. But the, the real worry for big companies, I think, is compensation. You've got a lot of legal companies now who are kicking their heels and wondering what to do when uh, the PPI stuff ends. And there's a lot of speculation that they're going to start getting into ambulance chasing for data breaches. And remember, a data subject who has suffered material or non-material damage shall have the right to receive compensation. So the TalkTalk Talk hack affected 157,000 people. If there was a class action for £500 compensation for each person, that would be £78.5 million. And, you know, non-material damages, I was worried that my bank details were going to be compromised. You don't have to show actual harm. Just worrying about it was enough. So that's crucial. That's really important. Um, so all of that said, that's the financial gubbins out of the way. Let's talk about how you can stop any of that happening to you. The, uh, GDPR has uh, eight principles. They are legality, transparency, and fairness, purpose limitation, minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality, and accountability. That's seven, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ah, seven then. Um, we're going to talk about each of those in detail now. So legality, the lawfulness of processing, is the performance of a contract or to move towards entering into a contract is the top one for me. This is your legal reason for processing data. So in your privacy policy, you've got to say, we're storing this data on you and this is why. So uh, that's a really good one. Um, compliance with the legal obligation, account stuff, for example, that is um, if you're holding people's names and addresses because you've issued invoices to them, that would be a legal obligation. Legitimate interests of the controller. Uh, now, that's really crucial because a lot of people are going to depend on this. Necessary for the legitimate interest of the controller, except where out, those interests are outweighed by the interest rights or freedoms of the data subject. Now, 
back to Recital 47 that I mentioned earlier, Recital 47 says that you may process data for marketing purposes. It may be a legitimate interest of the controller for marketing, direct marketing. And that's really good because it means we've got a legal reason to hold this data. It doesn't mean you can market to those people. That's covered by PECA. It only means that you're allowed to hold their data. That's a subtle difference. Um, we're gonna come on to that when we talk about PECA properly. So uh, public authorities cannot use legitimate interests. Um, I'm sure there's no public authorities in here, so that's okay. Um, <clears throat> also to safeguard the vital interest of the data subject, another reason for processing data, vital interests are generally regarded as life-threatening stuff. So if you have to store information about allergies, that would be special category data because it's health related, but you can use the legitimate interest of a uh, legal reason of vital interest of the data subject, and then you wouldn't need consent for them. Um, or it's gonna be necessary for a task carried out in the public interest. Um, again, probably doesn't affect most of us here, um, but news organizations and stuff may use that one. And then finally, consent of the data subject. And I say finally, I've put this last because consent of the data subject is the last legal reason you should look for. You should try and use any of the other legal reasons before you get to consent. And we'll talk about that shortly. So, legal reasons for processing. Next is transparency. We've already mentioned this briefly, but being transparent about how you're using information. So information on how an organization is using PII must be in a concise, transparent, intelligent for, intelligible form using clear and plain language. Also, the, the uh, GDPR regulations specifically say that that must be suitable to the audience that the, of the data. So if you're dealing with 13, 14 year olds, it must be in a language that they will be able to understand. Um, also, this is basically talking about a privacy policy. It must be easily accessible, so it should be on your website. It should be uh, any emails that you send out. You should have a privacy policy linked in there as well to tell people what you're doing with the data and why, and we'll come on to that again shortly. So fairness. Fairness is a weird one. <clears throat> it appears several times in the GDPR document, only, only twice, I think, in the GDPR document. But um, it's a crucial principle that they want companies to be fair with people's data. That means you need to obey the rights of the data subject. There cannot be an imbalance between the data subject and the data controller. So in practice, what that means is, um, I saw a question on a Facebook GDPR forum yesterday that said, I'm monitoring my employees' emails and phone calls. Uh, and I'm using consent to do that. Um, so under GDPR, that would be illegal because there's a clear imbalance there. The employer is saying, give me your consent to monitor your phone calls and emails. And the employee really has no way to say no. So if there is an imbalance, consent would not be legal. That's okay because they could use legitimate interests instead. Sorry. So... Be fair with the individual's data. A test I heard, there's um, a guy called John Mitchison who's um, very high up in the DMA to do with data privacy. And he told me about a friend in the room test. And the basic principle is, if you're having these discussions around a table about what you're doing with people's data, imagine there's a customer or a friend sitting in the room, an unbiased listener, uh, or somebody whose data you're talking about, and imagine how they would feel about the conversation you're having, about what you're trying to do with their data. If you feel at all embarrassed about what you're trying to do, then it's probably not fair. <clears throat> so, that's fairness. Right, purpose limitation. We're going to run through a bunch of text from articles. Um, I'll, as I say, leave them in the slides. You can refer to them later. But lots of these articles, they're all 5.1 something. So 5.1b says personal data should be collected for specified explicit and legitimate purposes and not processed further in a manner that is incompatible with those purposes. 
What that means in practice is if you collect data and say, I'm using this data for you know, marketing or processing your order or whatever it might be, you can't then go along and say, oh, I've had a brilliant idea for a new business. Let, let's use all of these people's data and email them. Um, that would be incompatible with the purpose that the data was collected. So you've got to be careful about that. Minimization basically says that data will be adequate, relevant, and limited to what's necessary for the purpose which they're processed. Going back to the example I said earlier, um, you can't collect somebody's dog's name and their inside leg measurement if they're just buying nail polish from you. Um, there's, there's no justification for that. So only ask what you actually need um, to do the, the data processing that you're talking about. Um, accuracy, another article 5.1, this time D. Personal data should be accurate and where necessary kept up to date. Now that's crucial. Um, it says every reasonable step must be taken to ensure that personal data that are inaccurate are erased or rect rectified without delay. Importantly here, it's accurate according to the purpose it was collected for. So if you have somebody's old address on an invoice, um, a historic invoice, and they say, I want my data corrected, you can quite happily say, well, no, because that was the address we invoiced or the address we delivered to or whatever. Um, you, you don't necessarily have to correct it if it was accurate for the purpose it was collected for. But if data is inaccurate, the data subject has the right to have it updated. So storage limitation, again, really, really crucial one, very different for a lot of organizations. Article 5.1 says data should be kept for no longer than is necessary for the purposes for which the data are processed. So again, that's really important that you can't just hang on to data for 10 years because it's nice. Um, if you've got a justification for keeping that data, i.e. they're still a customer and we need their transaction history and so on, then that's okay. But there will come a point where you have to say, this data is out of date, it's no longer valid, we have to delete it. And you also have to tell people in the privacy policy how long you're going to keep that data for, or if you can't say you know, categorically how long you're going to keep it for, you can tell them how the period of the retention period is determined. So it might be we're gonna keep it for a year after you cease being a customer. Also remember that privacy policies can specify different things for different parts of the data. So it might be that you have to keep the invoice, invoice details for seven years for accounting purposes, but you might have other data on that person that's covered differently and you might delete that a year after they cease being a customer, for example. So, um, integrity and confidentiality, more Article 5.1. It's quite a long article, that one. Personal data should be processed in a manner that ensures appropriate security of the personal data using appropriate technical and organizational measures. That's what we talked about earlier. And the ICO are getting really hot on this stuff, that if you're not uh, putting in place organizational controls, if people are able to access the data that shouldn't be able to access the data, the ICO are taking a very dim view of that and are actually fining people. So TalkTalk Talk got fined £100,000 because they had a, a data a processor, a call center in India, who the staff at the call center had pretty unrestricted access to a very large set of data and they could view lots and lots of records on screen at once and they could download it. And they did. And then they used it for fraud. Uh, so TalkTalk Talk got fined 100000 for a lack of organizational security to uh, prevent that happening. They could have had technical measures as well. Um, there should have been a combination of both. So finally moving on from Article 5.1, accountability. Article 5.2 says you've got to be able to demonstrate compliance with Paragraph 1. That's Article 5.1, which is everything we just talked about. You have to be able to show to the ICO or to a data subject that you've done all of this stuff and that you're complying. So those are the principles of GDPR. We also have data subjects rights and the, the rights of the data subject are fairly sweeping, but again, we'll talk about those in detail and they're not all particularly scary. So the data subject has the right to be informed. They have the right of access, 
the right to rectification, the right to erasure, the right to restrict processing, the right to data portability, the right to object, and rights in relation to automated decision making and profiling. Although I think the copywriters were better on the first few. Um, we'll talk about all of those in detail then. So the right to be informed, they, at the point that the data subject is handing their data over, they need to be told the identity and contact details of the data controller. This is in the privacy policy. It can be, if they're filling in an on-screen form for you, um, you know, they're, they're purchasing something or they're registering for your mailing list or whatever, um, you can have a privacy policy linked at the bottom and they can click on that and see the privacy policy. The privacy policy must be in, as we said earlier, in simple language and actually should be separate from huge long terms and conditions and stuff. You, you want the privacy policy to be just the privacy policy that only covers the bare minimum that it has to. So that will include the identity and contact details of the controller. The contact details for the data protection officer where applicable, we'll talk about DPOs shortly. The purposes of the processing, what you're, why are you processing this data? The legal basis for that, and if it's based on legitimate interests, what they are. So you can't just say, oh, it's for my legitimate interests. You have to explain what they are. Um, and any other recipients of the personal data. Now, that's crucial. Um, this really applies to... It's more applicable to third parties than data processors. Um, but you have to tell people, especially if the data is going to be transferred outside of the EU, uh, where that data is going to be going to and how they know it's adequately protected. Um, there are instances, when it comes to third parties, there's been quite a few instances recently um, of fines that we'll talk about when we get to PECA, because um, they've actually been prosecuted under PECA rather than, G well, DPA, GDPR, can't be prosecuted yet. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's an important one. So if you are using third party services, you've got to tell people about them. So more right to be informed. Um, as I, oh yeah, just said, if the data controller is transferring data to a third country or international organization, you've got to tell them, uh, where they can see the relevant policies for how their data is protected. Now that also becomes more serious if the data, the third country doesn't have an adequacy statement. An adequacy statement means that the EU authorities have established that this other country has similar levels of data protection or acceptable levels of data protection. Um, so, for example, in the case of the US, there is a, a system called Privacy Shield. There was a system called Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor was ruled illegal, um, even though it was an EU thing that was challenged in court. Privacy Shield is the new scheme that companies have to sign up to. I only mention Safe Harbor because I have seen very recently some companies still referring to it, but it's defunct now, and it means probably they're not taking data protection as seriously as they should. Um, a company can sign up to Privacy Shield, and you can just go and Google Privacy Shield, and you'll be able to see a list of companies. You can search for people on that list and see if they've signed up. Uh, that, was, that effectively is voluntary for them saying they've, they're, they're uh, although, oh, that's weird, that's right. I don't need my speaker, I'm sure everybody can, I'm hopefully everybody can still hear me. Um, so the, if they've signed up to Privacy Shield, you can go and check that company. So if you're using MailChimp or Dropbox or whatever else, uh, go and check that they're signed up properly. You also have to tell them the period for which the personal data will be stored, as we mentioned earlier, or, or if it's not possible, the criteria used to determine the period. And you have to tell them of the existence of their rights under GDPR, so all of the stuff we're talking about now, including the right to lodge a complaint with the supervisory authority. Um, Again, that's not explicitly mentioned in the, the normal rights in GDPR, but it is a fundamental right of the customers. So, information obtained directly from the data subject. This is, there's two ways that you can get data from or about a person. From them, not from them. And you have to treat it slightly differently. So, where the information is obtained directly from the data subject, you have to tell them all of this stuff 
at the time the data is obtained, normally through a privacy notice on the website. Um, ah, <laughs> this is a, a bullet point that's been left in from my event management stuff that I've been doing. Um, but it, it applies here as well. If you're, what, consider on-site registration, it says. So, for example, um, if I'm running an event and I, most people are registering online, they can click on the link and see the, on, the, the privacy policy quite easily. If they get somebody hasn't registered online and they turn up at the event and they want to register, then they still need to be told where that privacy policy is. Uh, you might print it out and put it laminated on the desk. You might just give them a tell them a link to it or something like that. I mean, there are situations. So GDPR is going to involve breaches for a lot of organisations, but there'll be tiny minor breaches of no consequence but there'll be breaches nonetheless an example of that would be um i'm at an exhibition and i bump into Stu and i'm wowed by his suit and I, he gives me his business card if i take a business card off somebody and don't at that point tell them where they can find my privacy policy with all of this information in i'm technically in violation of gdpr although in reality that's not going to happen but that's the level of it. So it's just worth being aware of. If the information is not obtained directly from the data subject, then you have to tell the data subject where you got their data from uh, within a reasonable period after obtaining the data, but at the latest within a month of having that data. So if you've bought in a mailing list, we'll talk about that specifically in a few minutes, um, but the general advice is don't, but within a reasonable period, yeah, at the latest within one month. So if you buy in a, date, a mailing list, you have to email people out within a month and say, this is where we bought your data from and this is what we're going to do with it and who the DPO and the data controller and all the rest of it is. Um, if um, the data is going to be used for communication with the data subject, so you've bought in a mailing list, then you can't say, oh, well, I'll leave it a month until I tell them the privacy policy. You've got to tell them at the time of first communication, but that still has to be within a month. So it, it covers a few bases with that one. Okay, the right of access. This is often known as a subject access request. Um, these are already possible, but a couple of things have changed fairly seriously for, with this. First of all, GDPR explicitly says that has one month to reply. That's not 30 days or 31 days, so you should plan for four weeks uh, as a, a policy to, to reply to people because worst case scenario, they ask you in February, then you've only got 28 days to reply. Um, you have to give them confirmation of whether their data is being processed, all of the right to be informed information, and a copy of their data. It also says if the request is made electronically, it, the data will be provided in a commonly used electronic form. It doesn't define what that is. It might be a Word document um, or PDF or something, perhaps. Um, although, you should be quite careful about how you send that to the person. Um, you have a responsibility to verify the identity of the person. A lot of this is aimed at online services and trying to actually have people log in and see their data. So you can go onto Facebook and download a copy of all of your data. There was a woman who made a subject access request to Tinder and got 700 pages of data back, every interaction she'd ever had with anybody and all sorts of stuff. So there is a lot of data being stored and a lot of this is aimed at those online platforms, um, but it also applies to smaller companies as well. Crucially, this is different. The data controller cannot charge for this. So you probably should expect to see an uplift in subject access requests from probably zero um, that you've had until now. Um, it is, because it's now free, I'm sure people will be uh, trying to find out more. Certainly, when I get emails from companies that I've no idea where they've got my email address from. They're using an email address that's five years out of date. I'm going to be ever so tempted to say to them, well, 
I want to know where you got my data from so I can go back to the source and stop it being sold. Um, so that's the right of access. The right to rectification, we already mentioned a little bit. The data subject has the right to the rectification of inaccurate personal data without undue delay. Um, they also have the right to have incomplete personal data completed. Both of these are rights to request these actions. As I said earlier, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a right to have it performed. It just means you can request that to be done. But there are reasons that you can go back and say, actually, we need the historic information. We don't want your current information. So that's rectification. So the right to erasure, which isn't the 80s band I was sad to hear when I was on the DDPR course, sometimes known as the right to be forgotten, the data subject can request that data be erased and the controller must act without undue delay, but the controller can object in certain circumstances. We mentioned this already as well, to comply with the legal obligation to the exercise or defense of legal claims. Um, there are more details in Article 17. It's quite an interesting read. <clears throat> There's currently a right to be forgotten case going through the High Court in London with an unnamed person who apparently committed uh, a criminal act many years ago and then went on TV and was interviewed about that after doing time in prison and is now saying they want that act. Google and stuff. Um, and again, one of the objections can be it's in the public interest for that information to still be available um, and Google do rule on that sometimes uh, but this one's gone to the High Court so the right to restriction of processing this is probably quite applicable hang on excuse me a second <coughs> oh, a bit of a cough at the moment so the right to restriction of processing um, has a couple of different purposes. Used in circumstances where data is in dispute, if you're saying that there's something wrong with the data, um, you can ask the data controller to stop processing your data in the meantime until it's sorted out. The data subject may oppose the deletion, so the data controller can enforce a restriction. Perfect example of this is the difference between never email me again and erase my data. Um, in actual fact, if somebody, if you're if somebody's on a mailing list for you, and you email and you send them a marketing message, and they want to be unsubscribed, then you can't email. They can't erase their data. If they want to be unsubscribed, but they come to you with the right to be forgotten, um, then you can't actually comply with the right to be forgotten because you have a legal obligation to keep that name on a suppression list. So that would be. A good reason to not be forgotten no, no take, deny the right to be forgotten you do however also uh, have to only keep the data necessary to comply with the legal obligation which in this case would probably be the email address It'd be hard to justify much else um, they can say they want other data deleted but there might, there'll be a legal obligation here that you've got to comply with so yeah, you, you should possibly only keep the, I say possibly there, because if this is in a dispute situation, then you'd keep all of the data until the dispute's resolved one way or the other. Um, but yeah, keep only the bare minimum to comply with the res restriction of processing. So, right to data portability. I don't think this applies to the vast majority of small businesses, small to medium businesses. What it says is the data subject shall have the right to receive their personal data in a structured, commonly used, machine-readable format, but only the data that they provided to the controller and only if the processing is entirely carried out by automated means. So this is intended to allow somebody to move from you know, one service provider to another. The banks have been doing this in the UK for a while, but not necessarily across Europe, and it's, it's really trying to to move towards that sort of situation. Okay, uh, the right to object is a bit of a funny one. The data subject may object to the processing. Um, this is kind of a, a catch-all, if you like. It, it can be used before one of the other rights is 
you, you know, settled on. So the data controller will no longer process the data unless they can com de demonstrate compelling legitimate grounds for the processing. So you, they might say, I want, to be, I want my data to be erased. And you say, we've erased everything but your email address because we have to put you on a suppression list. And they can then object. Um, and, but you've got compelling le legal grounds there. Even if the ICO got involved, you'd be okay. Um, but your compelling legal, legitimate grounds have to override the interest rights and freedoms of the data subject. They have to be a higher level. Um, or for example, establishment exercise or defense of legal claims. If somebody says, I want you to delete all that incriminating evidence, uh, you're quite able to say no, even if they object. However, in very simple terms, if you're processing this data for direct marketing purposes, just stop. If they object by clicking an unsubscribe link or emailing you and saying, take me off your list, just stop processing their data. So that's the right to object. So automated decision-making and profiling. Uh, again, there's quite a, a debate about some of this stuff. This only applies if there is a legal effect concerning the data subject or similarly significantly affects them. Um, and the automated is by but processing is automated, fully automated. So this is banks, credit card applications, stuff like that. You don't have to be subject to an automated decision purely by computer without being able to talk to a, a human and find out what that decision was based on and so on. Um, and that's what this applies. Again, probably doesn't apply to most D, um, SMEs. So a DPO. Most of us probably won't need a DPO. Um, you should consider appointing one. It's not compulsory, but it is required if your core activities consist of processing operations which require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot of definition here on what large scale means. Um, there is an EU document from a thing called Working Party 29, which is the European body that's controlling all of this stuff. And that says, that says that you have to take into account the amount of people that you're monitoring as a percentage of the population. It says the percentage of the relevant population. What that actually means, I've no idea. I don't know whether it means the population of a country, the population of you know, event organizers in the UK. I don't know yet. We're hoping for more clarification in this ICO stuff that's going to come out. Um, all the core activities of the controller or processor consist of processing a large scale of special categories of data. Again, um, we don't know what large scale means. We do know what special categories are, as we covered earlier. There is a lot more detail in Articles 38 or 39, although for small businesses, there's a real problem here because the DPO can't be somebody who has a conflict of interest. So they specifically say it can't be like the head of IT or something like that because there's a clear conflict of interest um, and that would preclude them being DPO. The D DPO also is a pretty high level position. They must have board access. They must be able to report directly to the board and they must... Uh, they advise the board, the board should act on their advice, and the DPO is not actually liable if the board don't act. Um, it's, it's an interesting role, uh, probably quite cushy in some big companies. So, privacy by design and default. Systems should be designed with privacy in mind. This applies to any new systems that are being designed. You should um, implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure that only personal data which are necessary are processed. You also need to evaluate what the technologies are that are being used. Are they appropriate to the data that's being processed? Um, all of those kind of things. And also make purpose limitation, storage limitation. All of these things have to be taken into account when you're designing new systems. Um, these kind of things, and also there's a thing called a DPIA, Data Protection Impact Assessment. There's a good, uh, a good document on the uh, ICO website about conducting DPIAs. They 
are more applicable if there's new technology being in, used. If you're starting to use facial recognition for stuff or, you know, for checking people into premises, that kind of thing, then you, you really have to consider these things. Um, as we mentioned earlier, TalkTalk Talk will find 100,000 for a lack of organizational control. So, um, consent is the biggie. Lots and lots of people talking about consent. The, the ICO actually say don't use consent if you have another legal basis for processing. Uh, so if you can use legitimate interests or any, anything else, do that instead. Um, the ICO specifically say if you use consent where you already have another legal reason, then that would be misleading. So that's important. Although not for emailing individuals as we'll come on to when we talk about PECA. So detailed consent records are required. Now that is a significant thing. You have to be able to show what the person agreed to at the time they agreed to it. So if you have uh, an online form and the consent tick box was worded one way you, and then you change the consent wording, you need to be able to show which people agreed to which version of that wording, for example. Uh, Honda recently got into hot water and were fined quite a lot of money because they didn't have detailed consent records. They were marketing out to a load of people and they couldn't prove who was actually consented. They couldn't show that they'd got consent from people for, for this information. Um, so really important and consent can be oral it can be that you ask them and they say yes over the phone or whatever if it's on the phone you probably need audio recordings but it can be face to face at a, an exhibition or something that would still be okay but you need to show be able to prove what they agreed to uh, gdpr also says you don't have to repaper existing consents providing they're up to gdpr standards if they're not up to GDPR standards, then you do have to repaper existing consents. And this is, there's been tons of emails coming out saying, oh, under GDPR, we've got to get your consent again and all this kind of stuff. <sighs> again, that's very debatable. I would say most companies don't need to re-consent on the basis of GDPR unless they were explicitly using consent in the first place. That's the real gotcha. If you weren't using consent, you're better off now than if you were doing the, the honorable thing and using consent, but your consents aren't up to GDPR standards. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more with PECA. The draft consent guidance um, is there, um, but bear in mind that that, cons that guidance talks exclusively about GDPR, but actually mixes PECA into the definitions of it a little bit, which the, the guidance is good, um, but it's not pure GDPR. Individuals can withdraw the consent at any time. That's marketing again, that if, um, if you're processing, well, it was, it was, it was, but if you're processing data on the basis of consent, then the individual, the individual can withdraw that at any moment. This is the thing. At the moment, we've got no case law whatsoever. We don't know what people are going to get prosecuted for. So um, just protect yourselves. Make sure you are covered. Um, and as case law happens, then uh, we'll report stuff on the group. So, PECA. Everything we've talked about so far is GDPR. Remember what we said at the beginning. GDPR doesn't give you the right or deny you the right to communicate with anybody. It only talks about why you may hold their data and what you might, what you need to do with the data. PECA is the bit that controls whether you can actually communicate with people. So what is it? It's the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. It comes from the EU ePrivacy Directive, which as I mentioned, will be replaced by the ePrivacy Regulation soon. And it regulates electronic communication. So specifically, marketing phone calls, emails, texts, and faxes, if anybody still uses those. Crucially, PECA mainly protects consumers. Doesn't really have a lot of protection for businesses. Now that, again, subtle difference here, uh, and we'll talk about that shortly. But just to 
be specific, a business is a, co a corporate entity, a limited company, a PLC, that kind of thing. If you're a sole trader or a uh, partnership, then that still counts as individuals, which is a little bit mixed up. And although nobody's ever been prosecuted for communicating with sole traders or uh, partnerships, to my knowledge. So, PECA, first of all, postal communications, as we said, there are no regulations really covering postal communications. They're not electronic, they're not covered by PECA. Well, that's nice and easy. That's the shortest slide in this section. Telephone, this covers marketing phone calls. Now, just to set the tone here, for phone calls and emails and all of those kind of things, there is a clear distinction, according to the ICO, between marketing and transactional. So if somebody buys a product off your website and you send them a, a copy of the order, that's a transactional email. If that includes anything more than corporate branding and a tagline, then it could be classed as a marketing email and that could be quite dangerous for you. Um, indeed, Morrison's got fined for exactly the same thing. Morrison's wanted to communicate with the um, loyalty card holders so they sent them out a nice email uh, reminding them that they've got a preference center where they could log in and choose whether they got stuff or not but they also included a fair amount of um, marketing information in that email so it was suddenly deemed to be a marketing email and they got fined uh, they got fined ten thousand pounds i think in that case uh, for marketing to people who had previously opted out of marketing in, in terms of phone calls the calling number must be displayed. Uh, you must say who's calling and provide a contact address or free phone number if asked. And you mustn't call any number listed on the telephone preference service or corporate telephone preference service unless that person has specifically consented to your marketing calls, even if they're an existing customer. So if they're on TPS and they're an existing customer, but they've opted out of marketing phone calls, you cannot call them still. Um, the ICO last month prosecuted a company in Wales who were uh, phoning lots of people who were already on the TPS and they were just ignoring the TPS completely and they got fined £50,000. They didn't turn up for court and they got fined in absence uh, 50000 for the violation. So uh, they are taking this stuff seriously. Also respect opt-outs, even if um, they're an existing customer and you know, they're not on the TPS. If they say they don't want your calls, you respect that. Uh, email marketing. Now, I guess this is the biggie for a lot of us. Um, this is the exact wording that the ICO put in their marketing PECA guidance. First of all, you must not send marketing emails or texts to individuals without specific consent. That means you must have a simple way to opt out, both at the time of details collection and in every message you've sent. Now we'll talk about this. Specifically, I've, I've put the word individuals in bold there because this is B2C world. You can't send marketing emails to individuals, i.e. not employees of a company, without their consent. That's why, Lots of these companies are now saying, oh, well, we need your consent to send you marketing and we need to re-consent you under GDPR. But it's actually PECA. Um, you can send marketing emails to companies. The IC this, this baffles me, actually. The ICO say it is good practice to keep a do not email list, uh, or do not email or text list of any companies that object. It's not even law that you have to stop emailing companies when they ask you to. Um, it's just good practice. The same rule applies to any other sort of electronic message. Um, and again, this is text lifted directly from their, the ICO's guidance, um, but you can't get around it by doing a direct message via social media or any similar message that is stored electronically. Simon, can I, can I interrupt and ask yeah, a yeah. question? <clears throat> it says you can send marketing emails to companies. Yes. But surely you're sending it to an individual within a company. You are, but that's as long as it's 
a person within, if it's, you know, if somebody emails me on my RefTech email address and RefTech is a limited company, then that's okay. Right. If they're emailing me on my Gmail address as an individual, that's not okay unless I've consented. Okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay. So, email consent. There is a limited exception to consent, which is often called the soft opt-in. Many of you have, will have heard of this. Um, it applies to existing customers, uh, and they must be given a simple way to opt out at the time of collecting their details and in every message you send. So, for example, um, last year, I, my, my daughter's mad on nail polishes, so I went to a, local, a little independent website and ordered her a load of nail polishes for Christmas. Um, and then I got put on their mailing list. Now, technically, they were probably behaving illegally there because I didn't see a way to opt out at the time I made the purchase. I wouldn't be interested in their mailing list, really. So I would have wanted to opt out at that point. But it's okay because I clicked the unsubscribe button and it was all fine. So in those sorts of situations, people won't complain generally. But if I've purchased from you, then, and I didn't opt out at the time of collecting, then that's the soft opt in and you're okay to email me. But you would have to be able to prove that I was an existing customer and the soft opt in applied here. That's a crucial difference. If you've got a huge marketing database and you can't prove which one of those were consented and which ones were soft opt-in, then you've got more of a problem. It can also, a soft opt-in can apply to people who negotiated to buy. Now, the, the ICO used two different terms in their guidance here. At one point they say negotiated to buy, at another point they say discussed buying. So, I, I see those as different things, really. If I ring up and say, oh, I'm interested in this, well, or I email you and say, I'm interested in this, potentially you could put me on a mailing list at that point, but that only applies to similar products and services. Um, again, a lot of companies sort of misuse this a little bit in terms of they just say, oh, well, we've got all these things that you, we sell. Um, but again, again, it's not particularly serious because... Uh, they can show that I negotiated or I, I was interested in buying something. And as long as they give me the ability to opt out, then that's okay. This doesn't apply to prospective customers or new contacts from bought-in lists. Really important that. We'll talk about bought-in lists very specifically in a second. Um, and doesn't apply to non-commercial promotions so non-commercial promotions are things like charity fundraising or political campaigning um, but for a lot of small businesses this is really really useful so bought in lists <laughs> um, they're not banned by gdpr or pecca and this is this is text lifted directly from the ico stuff again it will be very difficult to use bought-in lists for text or email campaigns as these require very specific consent, either where the specific organization is named or it's within a precisely defined category. Uh, let me explain that a little bit more. <clears throat> precisely defined category has come up because last year, a couple of organizations were fined under PECA Regulation 22, which is what this is, uh, for emailing people they were collecting information on a website. I think it was called Head You Win. And people opted into marketing communications, but the categories of stuff that they opted into were so broad. You know, it was dog food and holidays and insurance and electronics. And, you know, it, it was too broad. And the ICO ruled that actually these people couldn't make an informed choice because the categories just basically covered everything. And that was crucial. So they got fined. There was another organization who sold mailing lists um, to a second organization. And both the company selling the mailing list and the company that bought it and used it were fined by the ICO because they couldn't demonstrate that there was proper consent in place. 
So if you're buying in mailing lists from anywhere, you have to be able to prove when the ICO come knocking that the people on that mailing list explicitly consented to receiving communications from your organization or the category, a precisely defined category that covers your organization. Um, there's a lot of people saying that these, it really has been stepped up this year, that last year with PECA prosecutions, but it, it could easily spell the end of the mailing list business. Um, I know from our purposes, even though we're dealing B2B, my company, we've been, we bought in lists in the past and we're just saying, actually, we're not going to buy any more in. It's not worth it um, because there's too much chance of us being caught out for not having proper consents under GDPR. Um, and e-privacy is likely to tighten this up as well, I would suspect. Um, but there's two different drafts of e-privacy at the moment that are slightly competing from two different branches of the EU. But so, <coughs> yeah. Um, Use bought-in lists, especially for consumers, at your own peril. Um, if you are going to do them, please read some of the rulings on the ICO's website. Incidentally, uh, the ICO, I'll just show this. Uh, this is the ICO's website. Um, this is enforcement action that they've taken. You can just, uh, you go onto the, the website and at the top you see action we've taken. These are the things that have happened um, and you, you see there's quite a few this just goes back to February, but there's a lot of other stuff. And you can filter it by whether it was a monetary penalty or whatever else. Um, so that, that one's actually an interesting one. That was an individual who was prosecuted by the ICO uh, because they uh, took a screenshot of a council database that contained information about children who were eligible for free school meals. Uh, that was a breach of... Um, data protection law but it wasn't a breach for the council the council had appropriate organizational controls in place to stop that happening the person ignored that did the screenshot then shared it with an estranged parent and got fined in court for that and there's been a couple of those recently there's been a number of nurses fined for looking up personal information on the NHS database that they shouldn't have been looking at you know friends or family or whatever else they were trying to find out their medical history and they've been fined in court as well. So the ICO will take action against individuals as well as companies. So, but it, it's, yeah, some quite interesting rulings. But if you're going to buy bought-in lists, go and read the, the rulings on the marketing lists. It will help protect yourself. So, things you can do. Um, first of all, don't panic. GDPR isn't a massive shift away from DPA, and you can protect yourself relatively easily um, if you're not senior management and I'm talking to C, uh, SME type people here but if you're not senior management make sure you senior management understand or make sure all senior management understand um, have a privacy policy on your website that tells people what you're doing with their data remembering that you may have different categories of data and you might treat it differently consider appointing a data protection officer and really importantly never email personal data um, emailing email is inherently insecure and the amount of clients we, we keep telling everybody not to email us spreadsheets of personal data because if it went astray if anything went wrong that would be a clear breach of uh, data protection law because it shows a lack of organizational control it actually demonstrates it clearly email is insecure spreadsheets are insecure don't email them to temper that a little bit, if you're sending a confirmation email to somebody, to an email address that they've typed in, if they type it in wrong, happens a lot. Um, I, I frequently get emails for somebody else called Simon Clayton at gmail.com who doesn't know his own email address apparently. Um, but in that case, it's not really a breach because the data was sent according to the instructions of the uh, data subject and the data controller can't be held liable for that sort of stuff. And going back to what we said about the ICO at the beginning, the ICO take a very pragmatic view to a lot of this stuff. There is actually an exception. Article 14 is the article that refers to uh, where data is not collected directly from the data subject. And there's actually an exemption in there that says, as far as it's possible. 
So if you've been given this data by somebody, you have an obligation to contact that person and tell them that you're holding their personal data. But if that's impossible because the email address is spelt wrong or you don't have, a, don't have an email address or a phone number or whatever, then actually GDPR's got you back there. It'll say, well, you know, you can only do so much. And the ICO always take that sort of view. They're, they're very pragmatic. They want to encourage responsible behavior when it comes to data protection and data law. Um, and they don't just punish people. I mean, documenting your processes, documenting what data you've got. I was talking to somebody from the ICO a couple of weeks ago, and I said, it's a bit like your maths homework, isn't it? If you can show your workings out, even if you got the answer wrong, the ICO will look at the workings out and go, oh yeah, we see what you're thinking. You're wrong. But they won't, they can help you correct that process and help you understand that decision and be more responsible. With things like data protection impact assessments, they, the ICO also um, actually encourage you to contact them and ask them questions. If you think there's a potentially a risk that's too severe to data subjects, the ICO will help you decide on that um, and we'll cover their helpline in a few seconds. So, more things you can do, or things you should do. Personal information audit for existing data. Work out what you've got, where is it held. Also, at this point, we've been doing this actively. Go through and clean out old records. Clean out the stuff you don't want. People keep spreadsheets all over the place. There's old hard drives and stuff. If you've got stuff and it's, you've got no justification for it anymore, delete it. I know it's sort of counterintuitive. Everybody loves keeping data and hard drive space is so cheap. But the more data you've got, the more risk there is. Uh, data protection impact assessment, as we said, for new projects or significant changes to existing systems, that's really important. Um, and this is also what was said earlier about if there's going to be a specific technological advancement, if, if you're using the latest cutting edge stuff, then you, you need to do impact assessments to work out is this appropriate is it fair uh, as I've just mentioned clean out any old data unless you think you can justify it when the ICO come knocking the more data you've got the more risk there is however there is also anonymization and pseudonymization anonymization is where you take a data set let's suppose you're an event organizer and you've got all of the registration data for every year's event going back 10 years which is quite common in our in my world um, it would be perfectly okay to take those older data sets. You could probably justify keeping two years relatively easily, maybe three years, uh, if you can show that people from three years ago tend to come every three years or something. Um, but take that older data and anonymize it. That means just get rid of all of the information that could be personally identifiable in there names job title company name you can keep the company name probably if you don't keep the job title um, although there are people that are one-man bands that technically that might still be PII but you're unlikely to get fined for it uh, email address phone number those kind of things um, and you can keep it for statistical analysis and looking at trends and stuff absolutely fine it's just the PII. Then at that point, once you've anonymized it, the data set is not personally identifiable anymore and you're safe. Pseudonymization is a different technique and is especially useful if you're keeping sensitive information. You know, um, if you're... I had somebody on one of, one of the seminars that we did that uh, was running activity days and as a part of that, he needed to know if people had got any allergies or, um, you know, stuff that they were going to be aware of that would impact them when they were doing the activities, which would be health-related information, special category data. In that case, keeping that data separately and you link the two different data sets. So you have one data set that doesn't contain the sensitive information and another data set with the sensitive information and with an ID that points to the first data set. So you can still look at the list and go, well, one, two, three, four, oh, right, now we're okay on that one. That kind of stuff. Keeping data sets like that is, a, is good practice because it helps protect it. If you lost the one data set, you'd need the other data set to 
actually make it work. Um, but it means you can still store everything, but don't necessarily have to, uh, you're not putting the, as many risks on the, the individual's data, especially with things like credit card information, passport information, that kind of stuff, if you have to have that. Um, also, educating users, really important. Um, users are probably one of the biggest sources of data breaches. And um, if it's you and your own company and your uh, one man band, then okay, that's fine. You still should do everything you possibly can to protect yourself. So uh, we've got, uh, so I'm building the wrong order. It's password selection advice. Um, it's a simple document that tells you how to choose good passwords. Um, but I'd also, also always encourage the use of a password manager like LastPass. Um, it helps keep you safe. Public Wi-Fi is potentially very dangerous. It's a nasty thing. Um, if I'm connected to any public Wi-Fi anywhere, then I will always use a VPN, a virtual private network, to protect my data because you don't know who can see that stuff. I've got a lovely little gadget um, which actually pretends to be any Wi-Fi network that your phone wants. Your phone, your laptop will be constantly shouting about the networks it wants to look for. Even in my office, my laptop's shouting about my home network. And this little gadget will say, yep, yeah, that's me, I'm that network. And then it'll let you connect to the internet and you just carry on surfing. You don't really notice that you're connected to a network you can't possibly be. And I can see, even if you're going to encrypted sites with HTTPS, I can still see all of the sites that you're going to, I can see images that you're viewing, I can still see a lot of information. So uh, be aware of that. Email attachments, we already mentioned. Um, even if you're password protecting the spreadsheet, that's not secure, and the ICO won't see that as secure. Um, people often ask me, well, how should we transfer these spreadsheets of information? Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with spreadsheets per se. If you keep them properly secured, they're a great tool and they can contain personal data and that's all fine, but it's keeping them secured. And I would advise looking for uh, an EU-based file sharing service um, like Dropbox. There's one called High Drive, I think, which I think is EU-based. But if you're keeping it inside the EU and securely, then you don't have to tell people that you're transferring it to a third country or any of that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, email attachments. Uh, full hard drive encryption of all machines. You can do that on Windows or Mac, um, but all of the laptops in my company are fully encrypted all of the time. Um, there is a tiny performance hit, but you won't really notice it on most modern machines. Um, but it just then means if you lost that laptop and it has personal data on it, the ICO will say, oh, well, it was protected. Um, and that has happened. If you lost a laptop that had personal data on and it wasn't protected, even if that personal data is not um, violated, if, if, nobody, if there's no evidence that anybody misused it, you'll still be fined. There was a case a few years ago where a, a teacher in Peterborough um, left a USB stick in a library computer uh, and the USB stick contained a list of I think 80 pupils with special education needs and she returned to the computer a couple of minutes later and the USB stick had gone there was never any evidence that that data had been misused um, somebody probably went oh free USB stick formatted it and used it for themselves but the educational authority got fined eighty thousand pounds for that um, because of the sensitivity of the data. So, if you're using USB sticks to you, to hold personal data, you can buy um, a. An, let me just find an example. You can buy from Amazon um, a an encrypted USB stick, um, not expensive. So these kind of things, USB flash drive, you plug them in, there's a couple of different ones, um, but you plug, plug it in and you then key in a number on the number pad there and that unlocks the memory stick. And until you key in the right number, it can't be accessed. And I, I would totally encourage you to use something like that because 
uh, that again, if you lost the memory stick, okay, it's more expensive than a normal memory stick, but you can show that you'd taken precautions and your data was safe. Uh, Simon, so? just, just one uh, question. What, yep. what VPN, virtual private network, do you particularly use? I use one called Hide My Ass. Oh, okay, fine. Um, which is a UK-based one. Um, is I, I've got I have very good service off that one. It costs me about seven quid a month, I think, for that. Uh, but I use it whenever I'm out and about. Okay, thank you. Okay, so two-factor authentication. Um, you should use this literally anywhere you can. Uh, I saw figures recently that said. Uh, something like only 20% of Google users are enabling two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is a wonderful thing. Um, what it means is that when you go to a website and you want to log in, then you get asked for your username, your password, and then a code. The code will be generated on your Android or Apple phone, and you go into Google Authenticator, and in my case, in the stuff that I use normally, and it generates a code. Facebook have one, PayPal have it, um, lots and lots and lots of sites have it. You should always enable it if you possibly can because it means even if your password is compromised, they still need your phone to be able to put the code in to log into a new device. And that goes a huge way to protecting you against uh, intrusion. And again, we'll show that to the, the ICO that you were serious about this. So, Getting close to wrapping up now, but the ICO have a couple of guides that are really, really good to read. They've got um, the guide to PECA, um, which goes into more detail than we talked about here. It also talks about electronic communications networks, which doesn't apply to most of us. Um, that's like phone companies and stuff, um, but it, it gives some good advice in that. And they also have a guide for GDPR, uh, which again covers a lot of stuff and will give you a lot of pointers to get you started. Uh, also, helpfully, the ICO have a helpline. Um, the helpline is very good. Um, I'd recommend ringing bang on nine o'clock in the morning, otherwise you end up holding for a while. Um, but they're pretty knowledgeable, and they'll give you some good answers. They, if you want answers in writing, they'll give you an email address, and you can email and get an answer in writing, which will help, again, to prove that you protected yourself. Uh, the answers in writing at the moment are taking quite a long time. Um, it took me about three months to get one, um, but it covers you better. So I hope that's been useful. That's um, my guide, my brief introduction to GDPR and PCR. It's a way more in-depth subject than that, but we just wanted to give you an overview. So uh, thank you for attending and uh, I'll hand back for, to Stu for any closing comments. Thank you very much, Simon. That was incredibly um, information dense. Uh, it was definitely worth hanging around to see all of that and to see the two um, different sets of regulations cross-referenced was, well, I've learned loads of stuff and I've been reading a lot about this. So thank you so much for You're spending welcome. time. <clears throat> Um, and sharing it. If anybody's got any questions, please ping them in, in the question box or, excuse me, <clears throat> or if you uh, have a think and you then want to put a question in the graduate square, I'm sure Simon will um, respond in time to that there. Happily, yep. Fantastic. So um, do we have any questions? Are there anybody... Uh, who stayed and wants to ask a question now's the time no nope, i don't think so that's fantastic cool. well <clears throat> we'll uh definitely update um grad square and hopefully the recording will have um been done i know how these webinars can be a little uh hiccupy with that but um thank you very much simon and uh thank you for sharing your knowledge no problem thank you for everybody and uh Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye.